Perfekt. Also, herzlich willkommen. Schön, dass ihr alle da seid. Hier beim 16. hat, glaube ich, Wetter gerade herausgefunden, netzpolitischen Abend schon. Äh, es wird jedes Mal voller und wir haben jedes Mal tollere Gäste, habe ich das Gefühl. Und weil wir auch immer internationaler werden, machen wir das Ganze heute auch so ein bisschen bilingual. Und Geraldine wird alles nochmal, was ich für einen Mist erzähle, gleich nochmal ins Englische übertragen. Also ähm, schön, dass ihr da seid. Und das allererste, was immer wieder wichtig ist, äh, dass die Veranstaltung aufgezeichnet wird. Also Seven da hinten ähm, nimmt alles auf, was wir sagen, aber auch nachher, wenn es um Fragen und Antworten geht. Bitte habt das einfach im Blick, wenn ihr nichts sagen wollt, ein bisschen nach hinten, oder wenn ihr nicht auf das, äh, wenn ihr nichts sagen wollt, dann sagt eh nichts, aber sonst bitte irgendwie weiter nach hinten und die, die was sagen möchten, nachher bei den Fragen und Antworten, geht nach hinten, sagt uns vor Bescheid, bitte Kamera aus oder lasst euren Nebenmann reden oder Nebenfrau. Ja. Bitte, um, yeah. Hi everybody, welcome to our 16th Net Political Evening. Because we're having a bilingual evening tonight, I get to translate everything that Linnea says into English. Although I'm sure she could do a perfect job on her own. But uh, I would just like to say, yeah, welcome. And we have a lot of exciting speakers, so it's great that you all showed up here tonight. Um, just for uh, logistics, we're filming and we're taking pictures, so anybody who wants to not be photographed or filmed and ask questions later, you either delegate that to your neighbor or make sure you stand somewhere at the back where you can't be seen and let us know possibly beforehand. Dankeschön. Und ihr habt ja eben schon so ein paar Bildchen gesehen von unserer kleinen Yes We Scan Demo, haben wir sie eigentlich nicht nennen wollen. Es ging auch wirklich nur darum, dass wir schön Bilder produzieren und ähm, das haben wir, glaube ich, sehr gut hinbekommen. Wir waren wirklich in jeglichen Medien, von Russia Today über El Pais. Ähm, die DPA war gleich am Anfang da, deswegen waren wir komplett vertreten bei allen kleinen Zeitungen, die so ähm, in der, ja, national vertreten sind. Und das ist auch gerade natürlich das Thema, was uns alle interessiert, ähm, Prism, Tempora und Co. Und äh, das ist bestimmt auch den heutigen Abend. Am Anfang wird kurz eine Einführung in, dieses ganze, in diese ganze Thematik Andreas Lena vom CCC geben, der stand eben noch da hinten. Danach wird Moritz Bartel, Gründer und Vorstand des Vereins Zwiebelfreunde, ein bisschen auch was über Tor erzählen, wie können wir uns selber schützen und danach kommt unser Ehrengast Jacob Applebaum, der gerade angereist ist und wird dann natürlich nochmal auf Englisch, so wie es vorher auch äh, Andreas macht, ein bisschen reden, damit alle, die da draußen sind und alle, die Englisch hier sprechen, ähm, ja, mitbekommen können, was, worum es geht. Ja. Und ähm, feel free sozusagen zum äh, nachher auch immer Fragen, Antworten. Jake hat da gesagt, dass, dass er gerne euch mit einbeziehen möchte. Excellent. So you've just been seeing pictures while we've been getting ready to kick things off from the little welcome committee that we organized for Obama on his visit to Berlin. Uh, uh, yes, we scan protest at Checkpoint Charlie. And uh, that, of course, is the general topic of tonight as well. So for the schedule, we're going to kick off with Andreas Nena from Chaos Computer Club, who is going to give like an overview and an introduction into the topic tonight. And then carry on with Mort Ritzbattel from Zwiebelfreunde, who will be speaking about Tor. And then Jacob Appelbaum, as Lina said, our guest of honor, will be speaking and giving the bigger picture of everything that's been going on. We really want to make it interactive, so make sure you let us know if you have questions and get involved in the discussion. Yeah, and enjoy. Perfect, thanks a lot. Also, um, bitte einmal, Andreas, die stage ist deine. Und um, Seven, alles klar? Cool. Vielen Dank. Schieß los. So, hi everyone. Um, is this on? Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Andreas Lena, and I'm going to give a very short introduction uh, about surveillance and about the technological and legal framework. And uh, I think we're going to delve into the subject vastly deeper with our two follow-on speakers, and we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. So feel free to, to ask afterwards. I think I got one basic thesis on this. One is that nothing has changed, and it has always been like this. And the second is the scene vastly changed, and I'll tell you in a second. 
So the first aspect is nothing has changed. With the onset of the Second World War, global surveillance really kicked in, and during the Cold War, it intensified and it was embedded into the infrastructure. So surveillance has been here for a long, long time, and using the data which has been gathered by surveillance is also with us for the past 50, 60, 70 years. The main aspect is that it's doable. Why do people eavesdrop? Because it's doable because it gives you intelligence. And there's a three-step process that is gathering the data, gleaming information from the data, and turning this into intelligence, into the product that the intelligence agencies trade and, and work on. And that's the first thing. That's the people that we talk about are intelligence agencies, or what they call themselves, the intelligence community. Now, there's a question whether something like military intelligence isn't a contradiction in terms, whether this is a formalized system that tries to gain information and distill intelligence from that information. But the question is, what are the rules that the so-called intelligence is being gathered from, from information? And what is the field that these people work in? Like the contractors that we see, now it's being privatized are doing this under a tremendous stressfully and, and clandestine atmosphere. So that certainly uh, leads into what the product eventually delivers. And so the, the slightly paranoid view that governments uh, increasingly live under, especially with regards to terrorism, uh, to me seems to be part of this culture that produces the, the intelligence. But as I've said, this has happened for a long time and it intensifies but basically, not much has changed. The second argument, what has changed though, is that the information that are gathered on us on a daily basis are increasing by the day. And there's two reasons for this. One is digitalization and the other is miniaturization. So keeping information that was written on a typewriter on a slip of paper requires vast amounts of storage space and it's hard to gleam intelligence from it if you retroactively want to know something about it. And that's the major difference that we now have. It's cheap to simply keep everything, and even if you can't use it at the moment, maybe eventually in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time, somebody might be able to find and distill something from the data. And if not, it's not that expensive to keep, so data is being retained forever. And that's something that we need to know. Everything that we do and say online or offline uh, is being kept indefinitely. And that, I think, is the change that we now have, because from an individual's perspective, under the different regimes that we saw and saw vanish over the past century, usually, if you were to be targeted individually, you had no choice whatsoever. And it's still the same situation, so not much has changed here. But what has changed is that, on a large scale, it wasn't cost-effective and it wasn't technically feasible in the first parts of the century, to keep information on everyone forever. Now it is, and that's the major difference. And to enlighten you a little bit and to hand over to Moritz in a second, the second thing that has changed is that now we as individuals, due to the sunken costs of computing power, have tools on our hands to do something about it. We have privacy enhancing techniques that we can use and that we should use and that we must use Though the question is how effective are they against surveillance tools and it's open to debate and it's open to everyone here in the community whenever you think about this, you might be, you surely are, um, more than I am and you're certainly cleverer than I am. So if you think of something that hasn't been thought of before in the community, in the privacy enhancing techniques research community, please add to it, add your experiences from the applications, how you use these tools or how you would want to use these tools and think about what your current way of communicating is and how inconvenient it would be to change in a way that is privacy saving. And one of the inconveniences certainly is using Tor and I think that's part of what Moritz is going to talk about. And yeah, thanks a lot.